This is our second tutorial. In this tutorial, we'll analyze the basis and the business relations and technical aspects of uh, traffic exchange and peering. And I'm, I'm very happy to present uh, Erika Vega, who's uh, an engineering manager of uh, MC and H networks, and she's part of the board of LACNOC, Nicolas Antonello, regional manager of the technical participation of ICANN and uh, founding member of LACNOC, Guillermo Sicileo, leader of R&D and in infrastructure of the internet in LACNIC and member of the board of LACNOC and Santiago Agil, um, electronic specialized uh, in um, data networks and computing in scientific and academic areas. So I welcome everyone. Thank you, Sandra, for your introduction. So as we saw, well, there's going to be four of us in uh, charge of this tutorial. The tutorial will have one first part that is more Theoretical, we are going to present many concepts related to interconnection and routing security. And then in the following blocks, we have more practice with a lab. We're going to explain it later on. So, to, let's start with a presentation that uh, we are going to share with Erika. Basically, this is to introduce some concepts. So let's start talking about how it is that today we route traffic in the internet. Usually, normally, we used to have this uh, the contents providers that uh, are connected to a tra to transit. Uh, providers or carriers, uh, the internet, that other AES interconnected, and then we have the um, these the users that are connected to an ISP and that ISP to a transit uh, provider. So the users see the contents that come from the content providers. So that is usually how the traffic goes from uh, a content uh, provider to the uh, the end user. Now, what happens when the content provider grows in size and starts sending much more traffic? They have to expand their links, the link with the transit provider, and maybe the transit provider needs to increase it to connect it with the internet. And if the eyeball if the access providers that give access to users increase their traffic, they'll also have to expand their links and the transit providers too. So we see that if the traffic grows from this content provider, the entire chain needs to be expanded. Now, what happens with that? It's not too efficient. So what was the alternative that the content providers found? Well, it's a direct peering, knowing that there are large networks with many users, and instead of expanding the entire route, they uh, seek for direct peerings with these ISPs and to install here their caches or their peerings with these uh, large operators. So this is how it's working today the architecture of the internet at present with the CDN uh, caches and other types of services increasingly provided locally. So how do we interconnect? Usually there are two basic forms. One is direct inter interconnection, the peering between two autonomous systems that interconnect their border routers. And the other, the direct interconnection may be complex if we need to have each autonomous system connected with all the rest, that would be very complicated. So we have the public interconnection, that is a set of autonomous systems that interconnect in a shared infrastructure. So instead of having this scheme where each autonomous system needs uh, to have connections with all the rest, in some cases, this 
simplifies interconnection a lot. Now, some basic definitions that we'll use later on. Transit is, uh, IP transit is the transmission of traffic through a network. Usually we speak of IP transit when we speak of the internet transit and that you regularly has a cost. That's a ratio where uh, an autonomous system uh, is in relation with another one to contract uh, the, the service to get to the internet. The peering is exchanging information, and routing and traffic information between two organizations that act as peers. This may be free of charge. In some cases it has cost, but when we speak of peering, very often it is traffic and routing that is exchanged between two organizations that may be similar. And we speak of default free zone. These are the autonomous systems that do not require a default route to reach destinations in the internet. That is that they have the global tables, the full tables of BGP, and they can reach all the destinations in the internet. We also speak of the difference between transit and transport. Remember that transit usually is a service in layer three, may be BGP or not, a provider may give a, a transit without having BGP or may have BGP with us. The cost is based on the number of megabits per second or the packets that you use. And it varies depending on the bandwidth. This is different from what we're going to see later. Usually it's used to send traffic to many sites. For instance, if you have an internet uh, traffic connection that uh, enables you to send traffic to the entire internet. And the traffic usually depends on who provides the service as an upstream provider. I have a provider and when I send uh, the traffic to that provider, how the traffic reaches the destination will depend on that provider. When we speak of transport, usually we, start, we speak of layer two services, Metro Ethernet, um, this is the most popular today, or SDH. And here you have a flat fee per capacity of, for a uh, link capacity, one gig, one giga. Now it's usually 10 gigas or a bit above that. But the cost is, it's a flat fee you know, because you hire 10 giga and then it doesn't, the bandwidth doesn't uh, matter. So it's not just based on the bandwidth. So usually it's used to connect uh, two sites uh, and what well, the other one was with many sites and the traffic is limited to organizations that establish transport. Then they may be routed to somebody else, but uh, the, the transport is to interconnect those two sites. Now, as we said earlier, you have the private peering and the difficulties to scaling it up when you have to interconnect with many systems. So it's, we have the IXPs. An IXP, an exchange uh, traffic point is where outside of whether network operators get interconnected. It has other names such as PIT, PTT in Brazil, the Portuguese, NAP was used in the past, but some people continue to use it. And basically it's an infrastructure that is shared to exchange traffic. And there not only do you have the ISPs and the content providers, but also other universities such as uh, universities, media, bank, uh, et cetera. Anybody that has local content. And that's interesting to share. Normally, there will be several uh, ASs that are, get interconnected. That's different from a private uh, appearing that is between two networks. And an important thing is that an IXP is different in, uh, from uh, an access network and uh, a 
carrier. The function of the AXP is to connect networks of organizations and not to provide access. That is, it does not provide access to users, nor does it act as a transit provider or carrier. Usually, an AXP should not provide transit to its members. Well, maybe having a transit uh, link for the services that they need to use, but it's not up to the IXP to provide uh, uh, transit to act as a carrier. Usually, it serves uh, to connect uh, networks that are separate organizations, uh, independent autonomous systems, and now IXP is not required. The traffic is not required to be into between two A autonomous systems. What are the advantages of the IXPs in terms of stability and resilience of the network? The first is that the local traffic is routed locally, and that has many advantages. Um, a, lo a smaller uh, lag, a latency for the applications, uh, it lowers the costs, uh, and uh, there are fewer possibilities of having interference with the traffic. It's more under control. The possibility of installing contents caches uh, in the CDNs. Uh, on the other case, uh, traffic of a region, a country or, or an area, we've seen it in other regions. This may be very important in the case of banks or organizations that need to guarantee that the traffic does not leave certain areas. It's useful to introduce new technologies, IPv6, RPKI, etc. And it also allows you to have a co community feeling that gets in the, in the IXP that makes it possible to share problems, strategies, and common uh, actions such as security incidents or technical problems. It's very common for the IXP groups to form their own technical groups where they share problems and solutions to the technical problems that they have in common. Now, as to costs, I'm going to speak very little of this because we are going to give a more technical aspect to this tutorial. In previous tutorials, we have provided more space for this, but it is worth mentioning that there's a difference between the cost of transit, which is use-based, and the cost of connecting to an IXP, where this is a fixed cost. We have the cost of transport from our organization to the site of the IXP, which is a fixed cost, as I said, it is transport. The cost of co-location of the devices, of the hardware, which will be a device that will be purchased and will be amortized, and then the connection and the IXP fee. So IXPs normally charge a monthly fee or annual fee for their service. But these are fixed costs, so is one as one requires greater capacity this becomes more efficient but here as the capacity that is used increases this becomes more expensive so this is how we obtain this graph this curve the source is dr peering you can visit there there's a lot of information on peering and the business model of peering and this is what I was saying, after a given moment, in the use of the bandwidth, it is far more effective to do direct peering with an IXP, for example, compared to the use based on transit, because we have fixed cost, the greater the amount of bandwidth that I use, the more efficient will be the distribution of that fixed cost. So there's a point as from which the peering cost is far more convenient 
compared to the transit rate. What is the basic IXP architecture scheme? This would be a switching architecture and the routers connected to that architecture. These are autonomous systems that can connect in this way. So if we only have this here, each would have to do a VGP connection we have to pick up PGP with these autonomous systems and would have a system that would look like this where each participant of the IXP has to have sessions with one another and if there's redundancy they have to have two sessions with each of the others. So that is where the concept of route servers comes up and in principle the idea is to tend to find a solution to this instead of doing VGP sessions all with all there is a device which is the route server which is a kind of route reflector all the operators have a BGP session with this route server for example Autonomous System 100 as a BGP session with the route server, 200, etc. And all establish a BGP session. And beyond the fact that the BGP sessions are with the route server, traffic does not go through the route server, it goes through the switch. So this device doesn't need to have such a big capacity. It is a route server that won't do any packet forwarding. It will just control, monitor the routing logic, but will do no forwarding. It will have the BGP tables, but it will not do any forwarding. And this is important because it allows you to run a software that implements VGP without a need for having a server with larger characteristics. You just need to have a router that activates the VGP functionality. If routing information is exchanged with the routers of the service providers, it doesn't send any packets, it just manages the routing logic and avoids having a large amount of BGP sessions. What are the advantages of a route server in addition to scalability? Well, on one hand, it is simpler to do basic security measures, for example, ASN filtering or BOGON prefixes, the BOGON prefixes and autonomous systems are prefixes that should not appear in the internet. They haven't been assigned or they belong to ranges that should not be routed. So that, those are things that can be filtered and should cannot be, don't need to be announced. If autonomous systems of private ranges or documentation, well, these should not be um, announced. Then filters by client could be made, for example, from the WHOIS or from databases, like the IRRs, there's information as to what uh, the routes that should be received by that client. So this is very useful for that purpose. It can also be very useful to prevent route leaks that can be the that can be the result of configuration errors. If you filter a full table to the route server, this will not go through. It will not be leaked through to the other participants. This is not just a benefit for the members of the IXP that do peering uh, with the route server, but this is also a benefit for those who do not do peering with the route servers or are not in the IXP because nobody there's going to be no route leaking of other autonomous systems to the ISPs. ISPs, sorry. And we can also implement filters through RPKI or IRR, who is, etc. These are some of the advantages of a route server. We're going to see in the lab later on how with a scheme similar to this, we can see some of these advantages. As we said, 
the RAD servers can be software implemented. There are two softwares that are quite used quite a lot. These are the two tools, a route server and the IXP manager. The IXP manager is one of the most used ones at present. It is a full management system for IXP. It includes a portal for managing the IXP and the members and it produces bird configuration. And the IROUT server is a simpler tool. It works on Python and it provides a lot of all types of filters and support. It produces configurations for BERT and open BGP. It provides, it supports PDB to obtain AS certs and can be integrated with other systems. When we have a route server, we'll have the possibility of having multilateral agreements for interconnection. As I said before, the participants can decide to have multilateral agreements or private agreements. This depends on each ISP, but many ISPs have the two types of agreements. For example, an autonomous system can do BGP with a route server and all the routes are announced to all who do BGP here, but they can also have private agreements Programs so, autonomous systems that have a lot of traffic with one another, so they can have private agreements to do uh, uh, bilateral agreements for private uh, traffic. So, in the bilateral one, each provider establishes a relationship requires with other IXP providers, and the multilateral, each provider establishes the sessions with the route server, with the concentrator. These are some references of courses we have organized in the part, past sorry, on issues related to route servers. Now, before going over, over to secure routing, I would like to know if there are any questions so far. You can ask questions in the Q&A box. And otherwise, we will continue with the next presentation. Now, we will go over to RPKI and IRR. I see that there are no questions. Oh, let's see, there's one. There are two questions, in fact. Could you read this out, Erica? Yes. Martin Rodriguez, an ISP that does not have ASN nor IPv4 blocks, how does the ISP do to connect to the IXP? Well, the IXPs in general ask organizations to have their own autonomous systems and their IPv4 blocks. And most of the IXPs that I know are like that. I know of no cases where they are allowed to connect with private autonomous systems or private blocks. They should ask for an autonomous system. In the case of an autonomous system, that's no problem. In the case of IP4, if you don't have blocks, the only option you have today is to be in the waiting list to receive blocks or to start using IPv6. Or in, if you can obtain a transfer of blocks to request a transfer of blocks that has to be then requested. But in general, you need the two things, the autonomous system and public IPv4 IP addresses, not necessarily IPv4. You can connect also in IPv6. Muchas gracias. Eh, tenemos otra pregunta de Carlos. I have another question from Carlos Escobar. Is it necessary to count 
with an ASN and a prefix to create an IXP? Well, it's the same thing. Yes, it is necessary to have an autonomous system and a prefix to have an IXP. To create an IXP, that's a question, yes. Yes, the IXP has to have its own autonomous system and normally it has a prefix which is a LAN. There is a difference here because the IXP can ask for prefixes of a range reserved by LACNIC, which is for critical infrastructure. The IXP will be able to do so. Martin, who asked the first question, he states that the transfer of blocks so this is due to the IP4 scarcity and transfers, transfers of blocks within LACNIC. Is this possible? Should, be, should this be from another organization? So the union of an IXP or the creation of new IXP. How would, be, how would this work? Well, block transfer of blocks would be as follows if the organization requests or obtains uh, an organization that is willing to transfer IP blocks that does exist today. This can be both within the LACNIC region or also from other regions. That has to do with the IP transfer policy that has been enforced for a number of years now. Now, that is something that depends on each organization and what, how they have their own IP addresses. Perfecto. Abraham González would the IXP need an ASN for multilateral agreements? Yes, the IXP needs to have an ASN and addresses in order to be able to provide the border devices of the clients and to be able to interconnect them. The LAN we saw before requires this here. These devices here will have IP addresses and route servers, so they'll have addresses and we'll have to have a LAN. And I was saying that those addresses will have to be requested from a special address block which has been reserved. Ready, so I think that you can go on. We have no more questions to answer. So let's talk about uh, routing security. There are two basic cases of uh, routing um, uh, problems. Uh, that is the route, the route hijacking that is announcing prefixes that we are not authorized to do, and this may be intentional or because uh, of a mistake. For instance, in this case, if the client here wants to reach uh, this network 2001 uh, uh, colon DB8, etc., etc., should come here to the slash 40 to the ASN uh, 65510. So the packets should come this way. That would be the normal thing. Uh, six. Uh, uh, 65501, uh, this one announces this here, so here you have the routing table, the slash 40 that goes through 65502 to 65510. Now, what happens if 65509 announces a blog or even more specific of this range? Well, if there are no filters, no security measures, the block will be accepted by 65502 and will be announced to 65501. So when this client wants to reach this IP, will have he will have two routes that are the same, but this one is more specific. So it's going to choose the most specific. So the traffic will be 
uh, uh, sent to the wrong one, to the 65509. This is a hijack. Announcing through BGP a prefix that usually is more specific uh, than the existing one. So we attract the traffic toward our autonomous system. The other case of, is that of root leaks. There are many cases where there are certain prefixes mm, that should not be announced to other peer or another provider. For instance, what we learn with uh, some provider, we are, shouldn't announce. Uh, all prefixes uh, learned from a peer should uh, not be announced uh, uh, upstream to the providers or the peers. Only they, these prefixes must be announced only to clients. If you are not careful, you are going to be making announcements that are not appropriate. For instance, let's assume that these autonomous systems have a peering and uh, 65511. Is. Each one announces its block. DB810 is of 65536 and DB820 is of 65537 and each announce their block up upward. And each announces through peering the, blo the block of their organization. Now, if this one, for instance, is not careful, they're going to let the announcement go up. If this announcement, uh, this if this ad comes uh, to this uh, uh, transit provider, this will be a leak because there are going to be connections that are come, going to come this way to reach here. And this is not what is... Uh, foreseen. The only wants to use this link. If it starts coming this way, well, it will lose control and will start having problems in this link because it may get uh, saturated. This one may be doing something with a packet. So this is the other case that we should avoid. These are the rules that uh, need to be met for that, to prevent that. So how do we check that the information is correct, that we receive is correct? When we announce, we have ways we can do that using filters or putting communities, etc. Now, when we receive uh, information through BGP, how do we know what's in the other side? BGP does not have intrinsic mechanisms allowing you to check that. So we need to contrast uh, what the announcements received by BGP against external sources. There are two ways, the internet routing uh, registries and RPKI. What are these? The IRR are external databases that Permit me that when I receive updates through BGP, I'm going to check against this database to see whether those updates are correct or not. So the internet routing registries are a mechanism, an older mechanism that has existed for many years, since the 90s. There are many databases. LACNIC has its uh, internet routing registry and the operators use that information to generate BGP filters, sometimes very often automatically. There are tools such as BGP Q3 or 4 to configure the routers. This is an example of an entry, for instance, this is Antel, Uruguay, where Nico Antonello is here in the tutorial, where for instance, we see the, uh, the objects. Basically, the important information here for the IRR is the route object, which is the route field and the origin, the association between a prefix and an autonomous system of origin. That is what the IRR get, gives us. So we can use, how can we use the information? Well, we have other objects that are AS set that allow you to describe many different things, autonomous systems, but also the autonomous system allows you to tell you uh, the, which where are the ones that we're giving uh, traffic. For instance, 65502 connects with 65501, they have a peering. And 65502 wants to give transit to these three autonomous systems, 10, 11, and 9. So it creates an object that is called ASAT 
we may call it transit to but this name doesn't mean anything it's just a name that you have to choose and should be explained somewhere what this means either in the description or in a website where you say well these are are the autonomous systems that my autonomous system gives transit to so and here you list the members of the AS set is that is a set of autonomous systems that's as it were as it's AS set autonomous system set so this varies, but this is conventional. This they, this needs to be defined somewhere, and these two need to agree. This one uh, has uh, this is the AS set that they use to give transit to these autonomous systems. So afterwards, this what this one will do will be to consult through the AS set. So, 65502 that uh, slash uh, transit and there you will have the members and each of the prefixes that those members have. So that can be done and by uh, manually one by one or to use the IPv4 prefixes indicating the IRR that they're going to consult. In this case, it's LACNIC, a list of access that it will create and the AS set. So what the command will do is to expand the AS set and to take each of the autonomous systems and for each of them to mm, generate a list uh, of access. And uh, when we put the AS set, we'll do it for IPv6. So see, notice that you generate the entry filters, the prefix list for a router. This would be the syntaxis of uh, if there are, this has syntaxes for many routers, variants, Juniper, Migratic, and others. So, by consulting IRR, you take the, the AS set, and from there, you generate the filters to give transit to whatever you need to give transit to. So that is basically the use of the IRRs. Here, I leave some documentation about LACNIC's IRR, the IRR for uh, default, so that you may know what switches you can use and documentation in general in MeLACNIC and of, on RPKI. And RPKI is similar but more modern. As I said, the IRR, they started using them in the 90s. RPKIs are more modern. And the idea of RPKI is that it defines a public key infrastructure to be applied to routing. So when LACNIC gives the organizations, the ISPs and the end users a resource, the IP addresses, for instance. In addition, it provides a digital certificate. So these are the, these are the digital um, certificates that are usually given, but uh, here this is for the autonomous system. And so that certificate will be a verifiable proof that um, these resources belong to you. That, that is the organization that receives the resources, they have a way that they are the owners of that resource because as they have a digital certificate, they will have a key, a couple of keys associated to the resources, a private key. So only he will be able to sign objects. And that is basically what our PKI does. It allows the organization that receives resources to have a public and a private key. The, with a private key, they'll be able to sign objects that are called ROAs. The ROAs are equivalent to route and route six objects of an IRR. The difference is that they are signed with a certificate private key. They are signed digitally. And the ROAs enable you to define the AS of origin for our prefixes the same as route six objects associated number of prefixes to an autonomous system. So all this information is um, 
uh, copied it into a publicly accessible repository so that the organizations may download it. And the application uh, defines a mechanism of validation. This validation mechanism is a standard different from the IRRs where there are forms of using the IRRs that are not uh, established, uh, but there is software that you can use. And this is a part of uh, this mechanism. So far is the part that I, I had uh, to, to talk about. And now Erika will te tell you about the validation of origin. We have a question sent uh, on the security of routing that is about interconnection. I understand that LACNIC uh, has uh, IXP uh, resources saved for IXP, for example, uh, an IPv4 block to assign to new IXPs. Are these handled under a nonprofit organization? Is this true? Yes. Well, it's I was saying it. There are specific blocks for IXPs. There is availability for that. There are some blocks uh, saved for critical infrastructure. They may be IXPs or other critical infrastructure in a country, but they are mostly for IXPs or NICs, NIC, for instance. CCTLDs, the CCTLDs uh, infrastructure, but usually the IXPs can apply. Ready? Here we have another question before I share the screen. It says, Alucano, RPKI question. Are there any demands uh, from RIRs to different vendors to access? speed up, including uh, the RPKI support in their equipment, or is it an individual decision of each vendor? Are there any sites showing what vendors uh, support them? I don't know whether there's a site. I, I assume that uh, where, uh, where in the site that I put, you have the RPKI information, but today most vendors support all the software routing. Uh, and it's been a long time, and uh, those with hardware, MyCritic was the only one that didn't support it, and uh, in the last uh, uh, versions they have it incorporated, so most vendors around support RPKI. Perfecto, ya no tenemos más preguntas. Entonces, eh, vamos a continuar, ya que eh, Guillermo... Thank you, there are no more questions. We will continue now, and we will now explain what you refer to with route valid origin validation. We're going to show the laboratories in the next two blocks. The practical session will now explain what we do in practice regarding this theory. This is the first thing I want to share with you. This key diagram shows how the RPKI scheme works in action. So for all this origin validation structure, we must bear in mind that our border device will be connecting with the management system, the RPKI management system. This management system has repositories at the level of the, all the regional internet registries. These are the repositories that we'll have to consult in order to know the ROAs, which are the digital certificates that we have generated. I will now explain what we have to take into account to generate these ROAs, the digital certificates for our addressing resources. But this is a repository, therefore, that contains all the digital certificates created so far. This repository will establish a connection through a validating cache. This is something that we will configure in our 
infrastructure. The server has to establish connection not only with the repository, which will be informing about all the digital certificates that exist, but also have connection with all the border devices in the network where we know the BGP table of all our neighbors. So with this valid data, we will be able to assign the BGP table, the routes, a valid, additional validation status, which will show whether the received routes are valid, invalid, or not found. So this is the the diagram, it will be similar to what we'll see in the laboratory. We'll have a validation software which will do this validating caching, which will deliver the information to the routers. And in addition to that, it will be connecting to the repository of all the regional internet registers, registries, which will be providing information on the available digital certificates. And then through the RTR information will be provided to all the routers. They will have the BGP table with a new validation status, which will indicate the information of the different routes. And from there, we can draw our conclusions regarding the routes that we might be receiving that are invalid. We'll be analyzing why these are returned as invalid routes and then to filter these if required. So once we have this valid origin validation system that has been activated in our BGP table, we have this validation scheme. We will have this information then. We will have information on the prefix that we'll be using for creating the ROA, the maximum length. This is a 24 prefix, and the largest breakdown is into slash 24s. And the autonomous system, the origin AS, is 65501. So with this validating cache, we will be able to have an update in the BGP table. So we have three Valid validation statuses. These are the statuses that we'll be see when we do the practice. These states, states can be valid when this is valid, information coincides with the information provided in the ROA. Then the ROA shows what prefix it is, how we are announcing the prefix, and then whether IPv4 or IPv6 is also stated if we're publishing it in a summarized way on the slash 22, or if we're breaking this down in 24 in, uh, segments. So if it has been validated, it means that the route we're receiving is perfectly well and has been validated with a digital certificate and contains the correct information. If the state is invalid, then we have to stop and analyze what is happening because the invalid status shows us that our router had information from the different, different digital certificates for that route that is being announced, but this information does not coincide. It is being an, announced in an autonomous system that is not entitled to generate such routes because this is information that will appear in the ROAs or this is information that is being published with a prefix does, that does not coincide. If we are saying that we need to publish our route broken down into 24 prefixes, and if the route we receive is from a 22 prefix, then information will not coincide. Another option is not found. This is specifically when a digital certificate is not found. So this also happens when we do a validation scheme. We see several rounds that appear as not found. And this is because the ROA certificate had not been generated and therefore 
valid information is not available. So not, it comes up as not found. So what does this RPKI system look like in practice? ROA is a digital certificate that certifies our route. These ROAs can be equivalent semantically to a Route 6 object. The, the ROAs associate a prefix to an origin ASN. I published these routes, these, the following prefixes under this origin ASN, the origin ASN that I have, or maybe an end user that does not have an autonomous system and does all its publications on the ASN of the service provider. So we would have to create our ROAs based on the resources we have and also indicating that the origin ASN is that of the service provider. Those who have IPv4, IPv6 resources assigned are those people, those entities that have to generate these ROAs. These ROAs will be generated in the Latin American and Caribbean region and will be created through the MeLACNIC platform. There we have the option of generating these ROAs and then indicate which are the routes. The data we need are the user and the password for access in MeLACNIC. Remember that in the MeLACNIC portal, you have different users, you have different profiles. You can be one for administrative purposes, other for technical issues. And the idea is to access with the username that you have for the technical profile. And from there, you can we can manage the resources and the digital certificates. As I was saying, we have organizations that can have IP resources, whether IPv6 or IPv4, but no autonomous system. So these ROAs, these digital certificates should be generated in such a way that ASN, the upstream providers, can announce the prefixes. This is quite different from the IRR model because the creation of this digital certificate is done in a different way compared to other ways. That is why here those in charge of generating these digital certificates have to be those entities that have assigned IP resources, whether IPv4 or IPv6, even when they don't have an autonomous system. So what should we bear in mind? What are the main things that we have to take into account to generate our ROA? Let us look at this example. If we have a network in IPv4, 203.0.112.0 slash 22, how are we publishing this route? Are we publishing this as the entire slash 22, or are we breaking this out down into blocks slash 23 slash 24? And under which autonomous system are we generating this route? So this is information we require to create our digital certificate. We have to do validation always. This can be done through the ASN. Sometimes you have multi-homing and you can publish the route through different ASNs. So this should also be taken into account to provide the authorization to the different ASNs through, the, through which this network could be published. An important thing is that we should always respect this policy. We have to be aware from where the route is being generated and if how this is being published. If we respect this policy, our digital certificate will be correct. Very rapidly, let me show you an example of peering. If we have this connection between two different autonomous systems, we have an IPv6 and an IPv4 addressing that has been assigned to 65501. 
This one is publishing the network 2001 DB820-48 and the IPv4 one network 203.0.113.0-24. This is being announced to the autonomous system 65502. So what ROA, so what digital certificate should be created? We have to create the digital certificates for each of these networks that are being published under each of the autonomous systems. So if we see what other ROAs that have to be created by autonomous 65, 501, we're going to see that it's going to create the ROA. It is publishing the IPv6, IPv4 route. It received a prefix from the internet registry from LACNIC. This prefix is 203.0.113.0 slash 22. And this is broken down and that autonomous system 65502 is publishing the network with a slash 24 prefix. So we're going to create the ROA for the prefix which was received. We're going to create the ROA for the RO prefix we are breaking down and which we are announcing to the autonomous system 65502. In the case of IPv6, it is publishing the entire network in a summarized way. So we only, we're only going to create that. So this would be as follows. This is the screenshot of the interface of Milaknik. The information I have to provide is a name that we'll give to the digital certificate. We put the name ROA peering ASN 65502. And the one that is generating this is the one up here, 65501. It's going to ask me valid, validity from, I'm going to include a long validity period because I am know that this route won't change over that period. And below, I'm going to include the route that I'm publishing under this autonomous system. So prefix 22 is created, slash 22, I'm going to create the 24 mask. It's going to state that this is a prefix, a resource, an IP addressing resource, which is slash 22, but I'm breaking this down in order to publish it in my route towards the system 65502. So we're going to create an R R R O A for a two-year validity period. And for the IPv6 prefix, it's publishing this in a summarized way. So this is the information we'll have to add for our ROA. These are the steps that have to be followed to generate our digital certificates. So it's quite easy to do and uh, there are no complications if we have a clear idea of how we are announcing things in uh, our network. Now, <clears throat> then the as comparison uh, in the uh, autonomous system 65502, we'll do the same thing. 65502 will create the ROAs for these prefixes for these three and this network 192020 was received with a slash 22 but is being broken down so we'll have to create these three we use the same validity time and we say that uh, this autonomous system uh, it's uh, 65502 that is generating this uh, route and the ROAs um, is formed like this so we say that it's a uh, 22 uh, prefix, but we are using a um, mask uh, 24 that so we are generating the route and we create our uh, digital certificate for the IPv6 prefix. So we see how we can generate these uh, ROAs and now we'll go to the hands-on part and there we're going to have a laboratory where we will be able to configure some things for you to understand this uh, validation of origin scheme. We're going to have one uh, where we are going to have a validating cache that is going to have all the information of the repositories where we have the ROAs. And we're going to have a border routing where we're going to have different clients to connect them and see that information. 
Um, so we are going to have a, a contest for creating uh, um, uh, ROAs in uh, LACNIC uh, 35, LACNOC 2021, and uh, it starts now. And the any entities that want to participate, entities that have a IPv4, IPv6 resources assigned of their own. So any entity that has uh, these resources may register. You'll have all the information in the website. In uh, the agenda on Thursday, we're going to have uh, that uh, ROA uh, contest. And we are going to focus on uh, the entity that generates more ROAs in the resources they have been assigned. So on Thursday, we are going to be with you in a session to help you in the creation of, of your ROAs if you want to participate in this course. Erika, before you go on, let's have a break. But I wanted to tell you about the contest for creating ROAs. This is all week, as Erika said. And we are going to give some awards to those who proportionately, um, um, in relation with the resources, who create more ROAs in proportion with the resources. The idea is to promote the protection of the routing infrastructure to generate uh, more ROAs. And on Thursday, there are two blocks, Thursday morning, and the idea is that those who have any doubts may ask and have a more hands-on uh, um, experience. So Sandra will announce the break and we'll resume after the break with this part and then the lab. Thank you, Guillermo and Erika for this first part of the tutorial. I also want to thank the more than 130 participants that are with us in this second tutorial this afternoon. And before we go to the break, I want to give the floor to Andrea, who will tell us about the interaction of our virtual spaces. Andrea, any news? Yes, of course, I have brand news. We have the winner of the social media that I told you today in the first part. Simón Pérez Córdoba shared uh, the, the photos of his ID card and uh, he invited the people to share, um, to, to visit, uh, uh, to share the photos generated in the microsite. Um, so congratulations, Simón. We invite you to you know, go visit uh, uh, hashtag LACNIC36, hashtag LACNOC2021. We'll see you in a few minutes. Muchas gracias por seguir conectados. Ahora le voy a dar nuevamente la palabra a Erika para Thank que Thank you for being there. Now I'm going to give the floor to Erika and she will continue with the tutorial. Go ahead, Erika. Thank you. All right. So now we are finishing this theoretical part and then we'll go to the hands-on part. That is the idea of using this time to finish this. Uh, and uh, so we are before speaking of security in the routing, I wanted to tell you about uh, what has been done to promote uh, security with manners. That is the actions that uh, uh, were promoted by the Internet Society. The idea is that these actions will be implemented globally by the different operators in the network. These actions proposed by manners are a set of uh, mutually agreed uh, standards for routing security, where there are some actions proposed uh, for by manners to, for uh, network operators, uh, so that we may uh, go on with the routing. So we have the filtering, 
uh, the, the we filtering and spoofing coordination and global validation so i wanted uh, to leave you the url of the information of manners uh, so we so because we have specific uh, programs of uh, tasks and activities to support uh, so as the ixps the cdns and uh, the cloud service providers and the vendors um, so these are mutually agreed so that they, this may be coordinated in the different parties. So let me show you the different validators at present for the entire, for the idea of generating in our infrastructure a, cache, a validated cache and to have the information to see and being able to see the validity status. So we have the different softwares available that uh, I put here. And in the presentation, you'll have quite a few tools from which you're going to be able to download it and to see them in detail. For the lab that we're going to have in this, today's session, we're going to use the Fort validation software. That's a software that was developed jointly by Nick Mexico and LACNIC. So here, let me tell you, these are the other softwares that are based on the same uh, purpose that is to bring and deliver the information of the different repositories and providing the information of these digital um uh, to where we have a router so we have our bgp tables to see the validity of the routes the tools are useful tools there we have different tools to validate how we are delivering and publishing our routes and how we are and how we can do the validation of the certificates that we may have created and how we can install the different validators as a matter of fact among the tools that we are going to have for our lab today you are going to be able to see a, an in detail a detailed uh, video with all the steps uh, to validate this so far then if you have any questions. Thank you, Erika. But first, I'm going to give the floor to Nico, who's going to present some steps while we answer questions so that you may gain time with the forms and etc. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. Good afternoon, everyone or a good evening, depending on uh, where you are. Before you ask any questions, as I said uh, in the chat, what we're going to do after the questions is the practice of all this. The idea is that those of you willing to do this may reserve uh, uh, two machines. Well, actually, you have to do it in a group, and then we're going to tell you how to access the, the machines uh, of that group. So you reserve the group, and then in the practical part, you'll be able to access that machine. It's a, a, a virtual router, and you'll be able to follow the consolidation that uh, the structures are going to do, and you're going to be able to consolidate the router from zero, repeating all the steps and uh, continuing with everything in parallel. So there's room for 100 people, more or less, to do that virtual router to follow the practice in parallel. So I'm going to stick here two links. The first link, it says link of the form for requesting equipment for the lab. You um, uh, click there and you have the Google form and you only have to put your name and uh, the email address and uh, you have to fill it in only once and you put send and that's all. Then after that, you access the second link to visualize the name, the number of the group assigned. And in that link, you'll find a list of all the uh, numbers and the group uh, that you have assigned. So first, you're going to have the numbers in one column, one to, to 100, and then uh, the names that will appear as you fill in the form. You look for your names there and you 
write down the group that you have assigned because you'll have to access that group to access your uh, equipment, your machines. So reserve, access uh, the form and reserve your group. And after that, look at the next link to see what group you have been assigned. Thank you, Nico. While you fill this in, I see that there are some that already registered. Let's see the questions and comments. Flavio Herrera says that he's looking for routers to support RPKI, such as um, extreme. Um, um, he says that uh, with uh, Huawei, only some um, support um, RPKI. Uh, oh, well, you have one in the presentation. There you have a lot of information on RPKI. Yes, with Huawei only, the very large routers uh, support uh, RPKI. Um, it's not necessary for everybody to validate. Uh, we are going to see it later in practice that validation often has to be, whether you like it or not, has to be in, uh, available by the vendors, by the providers or who have complete tables or peering. Because if you have only one connection outbound, then there it doesn't help much. But so thanks for the comment. And there you have the link in the presentation. Leandro Ortiz says, well, I have prefixes assigned by different uh, entities, LACNIC uh, uh, and uh, VR, etc. How each one uh, with the entity that uh, assigned the prefix? Yes, Leandro. Each entity that has uh, assigned you the addressing uh, for has an interface uh, to manage your ROAs only in the interface of a LACNIC will be able to generate the ROAs of the prefixes that we have received IPv4 and IPv6 by LACNIC. For instance, for NECBR or NEC Mexico, they will have another platform where they're going to be generating the ROAs in the session that we're going to have on Thursday for creating ROAs. We are going to have people from NIC Mexico, NIC Brazil that are going to be present to guide you there too in the places to generate the ROAs in those platforms. Good. Erika, I have a question. Uh, uh, Luca said, uh, how, what is the validity of the ROA generated? Let's assume that I generate mine and in a few months I have a change, for instance, the one that is announced by two ASNs instead of one, only one. Do you revoke the certificate and produce a new one or should you wait for an expiration time or the Blacknik invalidates it to generate a new one? Indeed, the duration of the digital certificate is the duration that we're going to put in the space that I show that I'll show when we generate the ROA. If there's a change in the ROA, we have to revoke the uh, certificate and uh, produce a new one indicating, uh, for instance, if the autonomous system uh, is, uh, uh, we, we must uh, generate a new ROA and revoke the previous one to avoid any conflicts. Or if we uh, disaggregate the route and we are publishing it in a more disaggregated manner, we must indicate as the new ROA existed and uh, to have a new one. Two questions that are similar. Um, IP10 says, if I have the same network published in slash 22 toward a, pro a provider, but slash 24 in another one, should I create both ROAs and Oscar Olivares says, I have my prefixes validated and want to make a new, a more specific announcement with another ASP. I understand that I must create a new ROA for this new specific announcement. Is that correct? Yes, you understood very well. Although I rushed, but indeed it's like that. If we have a slash 22 published for a provider, uh, but we 
disaggregate our router slash 24, and we're publishing it in our autonomous system to uh, the provider, we must generate the two digital certificates. If we disaggregate it, we must generate everything as we are publishing it. That is why I said that one of the tools that the platform has the, of the LACNIC Labs is that you are going to um, end up from the numbers of the autonomous systems or the pool that you have received and so you can validate how you're publishing that pool. Bueno, este, no hay más there are no more questions. Entonces, Nico con vos. So, Nico, can you explain the lab? Yes. Thank you, Guillermo. Yes. So, let's recap. Um, first, let me share my screen. Dale, compartí nomás. Compartí que y ya me, me vuelas. <risa> yes, please share. Voy a compartir aquí. Es. Ahí, ¿se ve? Sí, ese es. There, can you see it there? That's the form that you'll see when you access the link that we put in the chat. So you access the link indicated there in the chat and you'll find that form, you fill it in with your name and then you open the second link that says link to, to see the group assigned and you'll find a screen like this one where here you'll have your name and the group. For instance, I have been assigned to group one, Guillermo group two, Gustavo Diaz group nine. Leandro, group 14, Percy, group 21. That is, there, there's space and groups up to 100. So 21 people have created, have reserved a group. The idea is to invite you all to fill in the form and then come here to the screen and take note of the group that you have been assigned so that you can practice. The idea is after you finish the lab, we're going to leave the server running. And you. so after the lab, you're going to have access to the, the uh, machines the rest of today. So you, you'll be able to do it, even if the lab is over. So if you want to do it later, I invite you to reserve a group and try it. This is a good way of practicing with what Guillermo and Erika mentioned. So now it's a fun part. It's part of the learning. So this is how the group uh, gets uh, created. So after you put your name and you um, put your and you see what group you are in. Now we have to access the machine that we've been assigned. To access that machine Remember that you have to write down the name of the group here on the screen, and then you are going to access this link that I'm putting here in the chat. That link, if you look at this, it has an X. It says GRPX. So let me start with a new screen and I'll show the screen here. This is the link that I stuck here. Note that here it says group X, GRP X, and here you have to put your group. If I was assigned to group one, I put GR1, GRP1, and you should see a topology similar to this. Only that instead of saying group one, you're going to have the group assigned. This is the screen that you will be using for the remains of the practice. There's still a couple of things that are needed to access the device. I'm going to give you another link now so that you can download the passwords in order to access the devices. And he'll find a, find a file with all the passwords. Please access only those devices that you reserve. There's room for everyone. So you don't need to access someone else's device. So access that link and use that file and the passwords. And then you have all these links 
if in case after the lab finishes you want to do the practice on your own there's nothing against that so you have the file with all the passwords for accessing this and this has been published in the agenda of the event but there you have the last link showing the script of the lab I'm going to resend the two links with the titles so you understand what all this is about there you have the two links the links to verify and download the file with the passwords and then the link for the lab guide there you have everything required to access so you access these links which i showed you up here you change the x for the group number and then you can access your network to the topology. So what is the network topology? The network topology is like a private network that was set up in virtual machines that has connection to internet. Then you have two RPKI validators that are functioning, like Erica mentioned. No, we're not going to rapidly look at the configuration of the two Sorry, Nico, maybe there were some people connected through YouTube and some did not have the link to request the machine. So, could you please, those who entered afterwards, what I recommend you to do to download, I'm going to paste this once again in the chat. So this file that says link to see or download the file with the passwords. It, it contains the links for the form, for the virtual machines. So if you download that, you have the passwords and all the necessary links for the form to see what group you were assigned to and to access the environment of the network technology. The link to access the network topology where you have to change the X for the number of groups that you're assigned is the one that I included now on the screen. I include it once again here in the chat. So each group, each one of you will have access to two of these devices. We're going to use the same RPKI validator. So if you not have the access to the border router, which you will not have access to, only the instructors will have access to these. And I will explain why, what we're going to do with this. And then each team will have a border router for their autonomous system and a client. To access any of the two, the client and the router, if you wish, if you wish to access the client, sorry, he corrects himself, the router, you click on the router and then automatically you will see this window here where you will look up the password file not passphrase password here in the password you write include your password which is in the password file if i'm group number seven for example where you see router and password i go to group number seven and this is a password for that group so this is what i have to copy and then paste. Because I'm in group number one, I'm going to copy and paste the password to access my right router. This is a password. I click on connect. And there I am in the router. This is an FRR software router. And those who are familiar with Cisco, Cisco this is practically the same command line if you want to see the command line uh, I, the configuration i put show run and i see all the list if you click on client you see the password file copian la contraseña que corresponda según el 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 and then you copy the one that corresponds to your group remember to change the X for the group number here in group number eight, GRPX, put GRP8. GRP8.
Está Please el número verify de... at all times that this is your group number. Ok. Ok. Bien. Entonces, eh, para acceder al cliente, lo mismo. Pego la contraseña del cliente, le doy conectar. The same y... to access your client. Del equipo cliente. ¿sí? Entonces, estos son los dos equipos que van a utilizar. Un router y un cliente. Cada uno de ustedes va a tener un router. Y... So these are the two. Router and client. Um, sí. Si quieres explicamos un poco la topología, Nico. Te, Maybe we can explain the topology. You might have to upload, uh, increase the font because it's difficult to read. You can hardly read the font on the screen and the commands. You can maybe enlarge the font. Well, you don't really have to see too much here, but I will try to enlarge it when I'm to share it. Let me explain the topology. Can you see the, 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 the graph, the, the design? So this diagram, could you just share just that window? Is that better? Yes. Okay. I'm just sharing that window only in the browser. Sí. Your browser is too small. Okay, well, well, let me explain the topology. Each group has a border router and a client. This border router will be configured inside an autonomous system. You can have an autonomous system that has been assigned. The autonomous system number We're going to use private autonomous systems and the name that each one of you will have is 65,000 ending in your group number. I'm group number one, I'm 65,001. If you're group number 25, we'll have 65,025 and so on. So that will be the autonomous system that you're going to configure in your border router. And then you have, you'll have a BGP between your border router This is a router of a traffic exchange point. So all the members of the traffic exchange point, which are all the groups, all of us, we start a BGP session against the router of the traffic exchange point. And through the BGP session, we're going to start to receive a number of routes from all the other members of the traffic exchange point and specifically we're going to start receiving some routes. How has been set up? This border router, which will be the one of the traffic exchange point, this one is connected to a route server and is receiving the entire BGP table. This is running in real time and it's receiving the entire BGP table. And because I'm not going to send all the BGP table to each one of you because we'd destroy this platform, it would be using up too much memory unnecessarily. So I'm only going to click on some of the autonomous systems and allow only some of these to go through. So when you pick up the BGP session with this border router from the traffic exchange point, you're going to start to receive, or you should start to receive some of the routes, some in IPv4, some in IPv6. The laboratory will be done exclusively on IPv6, although you might have to pick up an IPv4 session and an IPv6 session. session. You can do these two, IPv4, BGP6, and the lab will be done just with IPv6, IPv6 only. So this will be IPv6 only. To start receiving the routes, and then we'll start doing a series of movements, and you will try to discover what might be happening, trying to identify the problem, and then mitigate it, of course, using RPKI. And regarding the client, you'll be able to access the client, and with the client, you'll be able The client has pre-installed the MTR, which is like a enhanced trace route to do permanent trace routing, routing for the addresses to see what is happening with the traffic 
as the lab evolves, so things will be happening with the routes and the destination of the traffic will be changing. So you will see in real time what is happening with the traffic as the events take place. And when we start mitigating this, we see how traffic returns to what is expected or should return to what is expected. Guillermo, Erika, or Santiago, would you like to add anything so far? No, it's fine. Let's go on then. If anyone has any issues regarding how to access this or if you have any issues, please let us know in the Q&A box or in the chat or, or you can ask for the floor. I'm going to paste the lab guideline in the chat. I have just shared this guideline. I put the screen here and if you can click in the chat, this is the lab guide and you can also do this later on if you wish. This platform will be operational so that you can practice. I will stop sharing this screen and start sharing another one which is larger. So, can you see it, Guillermo? Is it small? Yes, it is small. Well, if I enlarge it too much. Okay, let's see. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Erika, could you please share this with everyone? I think it just was shared with the panelists. So while Erika shares that, oh, there I sent it to everyone. When we speak of technology, of topology, sorry, remember when we mentioned the network topology, we said that there are two RPKI servers installed and running with a Fort validation software. Just very rapidly so that everyone can see the configuration that we have and the Fort validation. There's a video that Erica mentioned, which can also be accessed through the lab link. This explains step by step how to install the Fort Validator and how to leave this working. We're not going to do that now during the, the lab. But let me show you the Fort configuration rapidly, which is in this file path. <coughs> This is a configuration path, and here you have several configuration parameters. The most important ones are these parameters that you have here under the label server. Here you see things, for example, our validator. It will listen to this and port 323. 323. We can configure it for whichever port you like. And within this section, this interval, this is one of the most important times. The validator, as Erica explained, what does the Ford validator do? Instalo el validador y lo ejecuto por primera vez. El validador se va va a buscar conectarse a los a los cinco registros regionales. It will connect to with the five RIRs and download the files. So with that, the validator will run for the first time the so-called the first validation cycle and will generate a new file with all the list of the prefixes that were validated. So that file that will be generated will uh, 
give you the complete list of the validated prefixes. This specifies um, the, the fort validator, how long what the interval to go to the rear RIRs and to check uh, and download and run a new validation cycle. In this case, this is seconds. Every 900 seconds, every 900 seconds, my port validator will download um, the changes and will regenerate uh, the uh, file with the validated files. This is the refresh time. The, these are times a conversation between the fault validator and the routers. How often uh, will the validate will will the router check the validator and uh, with, whether there are failures if it tries to connect with the validator and cannot connect? How long will they wait for a new attempt? And finally, after this uh, time, seven thousand uh, uh, two hundred uh, seconds. Well, well then. Um, the router won't be able to validate the uh, RPKI. Santiago, would you like to add anything? Am I forgetting anything? Well, the last part of the ROAs. Well, and this, at the end of a configuration file, there's a label, output. This is important. Here I tell my Ford validator the name and where the file is, where it's going to generate all of the prefixes that validated. And basically the content of this file is the information that is going to be transferred by the routers. Uh, somebody, if you can put an autonomous system in the chat, let me show you the content of this file. Any, anyone here. Two seven one nine two seven. Oh, Nico, vas a con el nano. Oh, Nico. Una buena idea. Mira, esto con el nano. Es el grep directa. Grep. Sí, pero estaba así el, el. This is the way it was. Hasn't it run yet? No. Here I'm looking at the output. The fort is running as a devil, as uh, as daemon, as daemon. And here I reduced the fort process. What the fort validator will do is to try to download this and do the first cycle again, the first validation cycle again. Maybe I should force, let's do something quickly. It would take me a minute, but um, maybe we can, um, we can look at the content. The directory where it uh, stores the tiles. The last time it stored the tiles were October the 8th. So we are going to force an update. And so the Ford, Ford um, brings a tool. So I execute the validator with this minus minus. So I force the validator to download the last version of the tiles of the repositories. So this is from Afrinica. And so it accepts I ask, I need to accept uh, the policy. I say yes, so there I can uh, check it. So I, I, if I look at the contents of uh, the directory here, I have checked it with all, uh, with Avrinic, Apnic, uh, Apnic, Arin, Laknic, and Ripe. 
So now we are going to run the first cycle. It will take about three minutes, the first um, uh, validation cycle. So it's going to generate the file that I mentioned, the one that contains all the prefixes that were validated. So we are going to wait for the first validation cycle to be completed. While this first validation cycle finishes, maybe we can move forward to configure the routers. Yes, because the RPKI, it will take a few minutes. Yes, maybe we can show the configuration of the BGP in the border router so that you can each configure your BGP. Yes, so if you agree, as Guillermo said, we look at the configuration, we look at the central thing in our traffic point. And there, I see what that is, the central router. And then you can each configure your BGP session. And at the end, we see how the Ford validator remained. So we are going to see the configuration of the border router. There. This is the configuration of the border router. The 100 sessions have been configured so that when you raise them, automatically you will raise uh, see it in the border router. The border router, what, ha what it has configured is the autonomous system is 65,000. Remember that if you are the N group of the, your, your, mm, your system will be 65,000 N. Erika, what is the group that you were assigned? Group three. So the autonomous system will be 65,003. And what Erika would generate a BGP session between the autonomous system 65003 and the 65,000. So here, for instance, we have the declaration of the neighbor declaration for the group, uh, for Erika's group 65003. That is the IP address of the router of the autonomous system that uh, is 164.13. If you are N, then this, the IP of the border router for everyone is 164.0.10. So you are all going to configure BGP session against this. In practice, there you have uh, the configuration to copy and paste. You need to get the letters of the of the page of, of the practice and change the X for for the uh, for your own number to configure the BGP session. And the other thing that the border router has is a BGP session with a route server that receives all the internet table and afterwards you stay with some routes of some autonomous systems, which is here in this permit list. The autonomous system 28,000, 28,001, 20, these are Lacaniks, and these autonomous systems that belong to RIPE, through which they publish some blocks for experiments like this. So we're going to only use the prefixes of these four autonomous systems. We're going to leave them here to install them in the BGP table in the border uh, uh, router. If we look at the BGP table, BGP, IPv6, we're going to use IPv6. So BGP, IPv6, unicast, summary, and there we see all the BGP connections and the status of each. And here we see that this is the BGP connection with the route server. And uh, these are the BGP connections with each of the groups, one, two, three. And notice that with one, it, the session has been raised and here group two and three, four. 
So as you raise uh, the BGP sessions, you will see the change to this group 17 too. You already uh, configured your BGP. So and uh, the BGP route tables, here you have the routes, this route that the router will receive. So if you filter this, these are the ones corresponding to those autonomous systems. These are the autonomous systems that are that were listed there, right? Let's wait a second. There. Here you see the routes that correspond to the autonomous system in 28,000, 12,654, all of them. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to quit sharing uh, the screen. Erika will share it and we'll show you the configuration that they have to do to raise uh, the BGP with the border router. Yes. So here I'm going to share the screen and I'm going to enter with group three assigned. So we are going to check our router, our border router, that would be this um, GRPX, uh, for me it's GRP3, and we're going to connect to see the configuration so far from our group, I haven't configured any BGP sessions. So let's look at what we have here. If you see that we have the information of the uh, interfaces there, is this is size right? Do you see it right? So here, as you see, it's you have the information of the routes, but we don't have anything configured in the BGP. As we have here, we go back to our lab guide and we are going to check how we would establish this BGP session. As Nico said, well, the guide tells you everything for you to establish the sessions uh, from this board router. You're going to have to copy and paste what we have there and only indicate in the X the number that you have been assigned to your group. So let's check this. We, let's establish a BGP session for IPv4 and IPv6. But before we do that, let's add the information of some other route maps that we're going to have here and access list that we will see more in detail. So I'm going to configure it here in my router, these access routes and these roadmaps. And we're going to configure it from here. As the guide says, so we're going to see this in detail. And when we run the test for which we established these uh, access lists, and these roadmaps, route maps. Perfect. Perfect. So, and now we're going to configure our BGP session as I have group three. Then in the information that we're going to configure here, I'm going to put BGP router, as Nico said, 65,003. This, this will be the information that I put here to configure this. Perfecto, entonces eh, configuramos. So we configure router BGP 6. Uh, 
I put the information of my network and now we started the BGP sessions with my neighbors, both in IPv4 and in IPv6, as you can see there. So let us, let us do show run to see what our router looks like. So all those people who have the machines should have your BGP configured. Listo. Creo que hasta el momento todos van a no, I think that all are with us now. And let us check. Como quedó la configuración de nuestro router. Entonces, and you'll see that in fact we can view the information of the route maps that we established, both for IPv4 and IPv6. So now we have our PGP in both IPv4 and IPv6. Listo, perfecto. Vamos a nuestra guía. All right, let's go to the guide. Ah, bueno, vamos a revisar ahora sí entonces el estado de las the status of the PGP sessions in IPv4 and IPv6, but we need to focus only on IPv6. Let us validate this after establishing the session. Let's see quedaron las rutas eh, el BGP establece routes look like now in IPv6. Let us check. Central, como no lo mostró Nico, in the same way as we did with the central router, and now we're going to check it in the client's right router. Perfecto. Entonces, ahí vemos Perfecto. efectivamente. So, here we see, in fact, that the session was established and it shows us the autonomous system number, the network that the IPv6 network that was configured, configured and now it's, re now it's ready. Erika, you can configure the RPKI part and Nico is checking the validator to see what is happening over there. So let us configure the RPKI. We have to have the steps described in the guideline. We have two validation softwares, the RPKI one and RPKI two. We include the addresses established for IPv4 and the port which will be used for establishing the connection which is a TCP port 23 and we're going to do the R 3 to 3 port. So we configured BGP, we haven't configured anything else, so we're going to pick up the RPKI from the router. Listo, perfecto. Ahí queda configurado y vamos a validar. Ready. And let's validate now. And let's check. La conexión. Connection was established and that this is the validator. Si tienen alguna, alguna pregunta antes de continuar. Do you have any questions? Could you explain what you configured? 
es este... Mostrame la topología. No. Eh, the topology. What I wanted to say is that what you are configuring validador que tenés desde el router so each validator you have from the router you configure the IP of each of these remember the port was 323 and the IPs was 70 and 71 the primary and the secondary one it is to have two validators working in parallel Bueno, este, nada, eso, eso era, sería la... So, that would be the configuration. The only thing that we configured was this, the two validating caches that we have in the scheme. And we'll now check if the connection was established with the two. So, let us check what happened. The thing is that there was an issue with the fort. Nico's fort isn't working. Nico. Nico. Yes, I was checking the problem. We have to wait for a couple of minutes. Just a minute, just a second. So it's working. So RPKI and RPKI2. So there's something that, you know, this is Murphy's law. Something happened. Something with the RIPE RCC. And that's working. But anyway. You could do the entire practice without the right prefixes because something happened with this. I have the latest stable version of the fort, but there's some bug in there. And precisely today, no, pero bien porque the validator is not working. But it's okay because Someone is saying that we are going too fast, so please take your time and follow the steps included in the guide. We are in standby, we are establishing the connection with the validator. Erika, check if the connection is working with RPKI2, because I was working offline and I left it running offline. So we give time to everyone so that they can advance. So far, it hasn't been established. Bueno, a ver, eh, right. ¿Cuál fue el que dejé corriendo? Oops. Eh, voy a hacer... ¿Nico quedó corriendo? No. ¿Es it working, Nico? No, todavía no. I see one, the one, number one is running. So I'll try something else. Eh... Creo que ya, a ver. Ah, 
ahora sí, te digo cómo solucionarlo, Erika. So, <ríe> esto, it's, it's working ahí, now. Eh, así, entra a la configuración de Conf. You have to enter configuration of PKI and eliminate cache one. Y caché 164. No, etc. So, 71. Just leave that configuration line only. And then you have to, inside the configuration of RPK, execute the command RPKI, reset. And then you exit configuration, you test it, and it works. I tested it in my router, and it's validating. A ver, entonces, la vuelvo aquí a entrar, que se me cerró la sesión. A ver. Listo. Eh, Nico, si querés mostrar. Nico, if you wish. BGP summary para ver cuáles levantaron. Show a BGP summary. De los grupos. En el router de borde. Which of the groups picks up the border router? Yes. Okay, just a second. Voy a compartir la pantalla, ¿sí? Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Sí, sí se ve. Yes, we see your screen. Okay. Ahí. Ahora se ve mejor, ¿no? Ahí está el router de borde. That better? That's a border router. IPv6. BGP. IPv6 Unicast Summary. Este... Los que tienen la sesión levantada son los grupos 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Y grupo 8, 12, 15, 17, 23. Así que esos son los grupos. Estamos unos, unos minutos más para que, para que el resto... Podemos esperar un par de más minutos. So that everyone can do the BGP session. Can you pick up? Could you pick up the session, Erica? Yes, I did this, but it didn't pick up the session yet. Can you see my screen? No. I'll stop sharing my screen. So we eliminate point seventy. RPKI stop group 3. Pongas RPKI stop. No, RPKI stop. Ah, ok. No configuration. Without configuration. Without configuration mode. RPKI stop. RPKI stop. Ya está. RPKI. RPKI start. Ahora fíjate el show de RPKI Connect. Now look at uh, RPKI Connection. Ahí está. Ahí quedó. There. Para que vean que no estamos... Bien. Que esto no estaba... For you to see, this was not <risa> These things happen, even in the best families. Yes. there are several that say that... Uh, yes. If uh, somebody... Well, well we, we should be able to... Validate this. See, it's working. We can go on, Erika. So, what we left was only one validator that is number two. Yes, just to tell everyone, Guillermo, what happened and how we solved it and 
what we are doing now. Initially, remember that we had two servers, two RPKI that were running, and all the groups were going to use the same servers. So we, we are going to connect, the routers would be configured with both. One with prefer, preferring one and the other preferring the other, as Erika explained, but the two failed. Why? I have no idea. Most probably it's a bug in the Ford validator combined with something that it didn't like in RIPE's TAL. So I, I took uh, the processes from the RPKI, I went back to, I, I deleted uh, RIPE's TAL and I run it again so that the validation cycle may run only once with the TAL that it has and then it remains like that. So that. The only problem here is that if in the future the regional registries update the TAL, my validator will, won't. Mm. But in, it doesn't matter because this is only today's practice. What's happening now is that of the two servers, the one that's running properly is RPKI2. And it has all the list of prefixes uh, of TAL except for RIPES. So, before going on, I want to show you something, trying not to break anything. <clears throat> now I'm going to show the screen. Are you going to share your screen? Yes, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share the same screen. There, do you see the screen? Yes. There, I'm in the RPKI server. So do you remember that we said that this file um, is the file and that uh, validates the Ford and it has all the, the prefixes validators. And this is the file that reads the router to generate the validation status that Erika said the valid and the not found and the invalid based on this file. So if we look at this, this is a big, um, uh, this has the autonomous system, the prefix corresponding to that AS, and this is the max maximum limit. This prefix, this for instance, is a slash 18 corresponding to autonomous system 12258. Of the, there's a ROA that says uh, the AS12258 uh, has the authority for this prefix 196, 28, 0, uh, and it can be subdivided down to slash 24. Any publication that your router sees of this autonomous system for this prefix outside this range of masks will be considered invalid. Nico, can you look for this? Um, 271. 271927. I, I, I hope it's not right. Who is that? Augusto Camacho put it in the chat. There you have several ROAs. Yes, apparently it has prefix 2803, EA10, and all these slash 48. Yes, I was, uh, I was going to do who is uh, to see who it was, but this autonomous system 271927 has all these prefixes slash 48 delegated by the regional registry and uh, the largest is slash 48. So this prefix will only be accepted by a router if you receive it from this, this autonomous system with a, a, only slash 48. So if, if it's not that, then the router will identify it as invalid. Well, having solved this and explaining what happened, and here you see that you have the file. 28,000, the LACNIC. 
28,000. Vamos a buscar en el archivo de... So, let's look at the validation file. Let's look the AS28000. These are all the blocks corresponding to LACNIC. And the autonomous system 28000 is... Uh, these are LACNIC's, uh, the prefixes that LACNIC has uh, delegated to itself. And here you have the mask of each, the, max, the maximum length. The longest uh, that is uh, enabled. So we're going to use these now. That's now we are going to see which. Yes, of the ones that you are receiving in the router, in the border router, one of those. So I'm going to quit sharing. I don't know whether there are any questions so far. Please feel free to ask any questions or comments. You can't throw anything at us because we are on the screen, but please feel free. Well, one is saying to review autonomous system um, 27008. Flavio Herrera. Flavio Herrera, Guanajuato University. Here we have three questions. So let's review the autonomous systems and then we'll see the questions. Which was 2708? 27. 27008. No, no me está respondiendo, pero bueno. Lo, lo, It's not lo... responding, but I'll stop this and then we see. I'm having bad connectivity. Bueno, mientras ahí establece la while well, let's look at the questions that we have here. But it's Martin Rodriguez says obviously with only one cache it works. With two, would that be backup or would it be necessary to have the two? No, indeed. Uh, only one is okay and the second uh, was a uh, backup. One validator alone does, does the job. Yes, that's right. Yes, actually, you may have several validators. Remember that when you show the configuration of the validator, one of the timings was uh, the uh, the time. Um, was after some time, the router, um, if the router starts with a, one that has a preference, the lowest prof preference, if it cannot connect with that, once it starts trying with the next and there may be a list of several validators but the problem here was that it didn't get the one because one was responding so it was not a connectivity problem the router could connect with uh, the validator but the problem is that the validator is not generating the file right so it responds to connections of the routers but the file is empty so it doesn't have anything to validate against, so it's void. It can't show, it can't validate anything. So it's a bit more complex, but you may have a list of N validators, N servers, each one with a preference. Then the router starts with the one that has the least preference and after the timeout, then uh, it goes on with the next until it, it gets a connection with one and once it, that it gets a connection it stays there and and when the time of the refresh is over it goes to the next uh, file well usually 
what we are recommending is to configure two, one with port and one with routinator. So if one fails, you may have the other one in different platforms. Yes, today, for instance, it would have been very simple with when port failed, well, we would have gone to server. Uh, we have um, uh, use validators one and two. Well, these are things that you shouldn't do. Don't do this at home. Have two different validators just in case. Uh, now, autonomous system. So here they ask whether LACNIC has a public validator that we can use. No, there is no public validator. The idea, the validator is a critical service. So if you're going to validate routes, it's advisable to have it in your own infrastructure, because if you're using somebody else's validator, it's very easy to make changes or to hijack by changing the responses or the validation results. Yes, adding to what Guillermo said, if I trust something, somebody else for this, I take this and this, I, I can put anything here. And uh, th this is the reason why the validator has to run in the uh, same network. It has to run the validation cycle and execute it in the network so that this file, uh, only the router should have access to this. It shouldn't be a server exposed to access and being able to change this publicly. That's a reason why the validator needs to be run in the network itself. Martin Manuel Rodriguez asks, uh, how often do you refresh the validator if there are updates? Well, well, it depends on what you have configured in the file, in the configuration file that is in the, G, in the etc slash port slash config. Uh, in our case, these are the times. This is the frequency with which the router will ask uh, the file again to the validator. So if and if a request fails after this time, it will consider that the validator failed and it will start with the next in uh, the preference list. But this time can be changed. Here I put 900 seconds, but you can change it for any value. Anyway, the ROAs and the validation files are not changing all the time. So putting it every minute, I think it doesn't make sense. If you have this uh, well validated. So what happens if uh, the validator fails and the router is downloading an empty file and has nothing to validate it against? Well, if that happens, if the filtering policy is well uh, designed to what it receives of the RPKI, the router will behave as when it didn't have an RPKI. It won't have anything to validate against, so basically it will trust, but it won't stop routing. But it depends, so you have to do the filtering policy well based on the RPKI. This is what Erika will show now. I need to write in the chat. I pongo well, IP. I'm going to put an IP address, which you could check with ShowBGP. That's a LACNIC IP. Show BGP IPv6. La escribí ahí en el chat. I wrote it in the chat.
Copio el comando. Ahí. No te escuchamos porque estás en, en mute, Erika, creo. Ahí está. Eh, bueno, lo que... Hola, hola. Ahí está. So, so there it is. Sí, sí, ahora sí. So that IP that Erika has just checked in the BGP table, that IP you have there is a LACNIC machine in the LACNIC network. And if you look at the second last line, right at the end, it says validation state valid. It shows that this is valid from the standpoint of RPKI. It has a ROA that was created and the prefix that is learned through BGP respects the ROA that was created. Nico, would you like to show on your screen? Eh, del 2001, 13, 17, 17. Maybe the 2001, 13, C7, 7001. You can check that in your screen. If you pay attention, you, the BGP has a slash 48. That's the second line. It's a slash 48. Nico, could you share? This in the grep that you did today, that's slash 48, to show that it was created in the ROA. In the meantime, Oscar Olivares is asking whether all the lab rights have to be validated, and the answer is no. Not all the ROAs have been created. So which is the block, Guillermo? The one that was pasted in the chat, but can put it up to 7001. So here it is. So there you can see that the autonomous system, can, the ROA was created for 2001, 13, C7, 7001, flash 48, with maximum 48 as a disaggregation. So that's a ROA. Nico is showing the ROA and the update that Erica showed us was a prefix slash 48. It were a longer one. It wouldn't have accepted it. Santiago. You can do this in your laboratories. We can guide you. But if you should do an MTR with, at the client side, you can do so. You can share your screen if you wish. The configuration change regarding the what was written. You have the IPv4 address that ends in 70 and one that ends in 71. 70 is preference one and the other one is preference two. So you have to delete the configuration, the other one that had preference one. Don't write 70, just one validator in your router, in, in your configured in your router. And this part that Santiago will show us now, for this you have to access the client's device and there execute the command that Santiago will explain now. Can you hear me? The sound is not good, I'm sorry. The, I'm sorry, the audio is very poor. What Nico showed we're going to use the MTR command. So what this does is to show live how packet loss occurs and so on. But this time we're going to use it to see 
how we reach that destination that we just showed, which was IPv6 of LACNIC. Now let us run this once again. Maybe you can paste the entire command in the chat. Okay. You can put it there so then they can copy it and paste it. So the idea is we go back to the command and we do an MT, MTR for this IP and we see what the packet does until it reaches destination. And if you wish there, you have that IP that we said has an, a reverse resolver. So what you can do is to click on the N key and then you reach IP to point 14. 2.14. So here it, it is reaching destination, the MTR, the trace is reaching destination, so that is working. You're going to run the trace again. What you can do now is to click on the R key for to refresh. So what happened there? So this is your exercise. So you realize that something was changed. The tracer was reaching there. If you're doing the MTR, it was reaching destination, but now it doesn't reach there. But maybe Erica can show us, she can do the same BGP show to see if anything changed and what the route looks like from each of your borders. Ahí te dejo compartir. Ahí está. Erika, no sé si, que, si querés compartir la pantalla. Erika, ¿would you like to share your screen now? Y compararlo con el anterior. And execute the same command in order to compare it with the previous one to see what it looks like now. In other words, to repeat the last one. That showed the status, the one that showed the status of the block. Ahí está. Ahí está. Teníamos el bloque en estado válido. So there we had the block. It was valid and it was a 28,000 autonomous system. We execute the same command. And if you pay attention, the validation status is invalid. Previously, it was valid. And if you look at the AS path, it is no longer originated, originated in the autonomous system 28,000. So the block you're receiving now in the client's router coming from the IXP router is the same block, but coming from the autonomous system 65002. So anything related to this prefix slash 48 that originated in a different autonomous system other than the one of LACNIC would be interpreted by the router as invalid because it does not coincide with the validation done by the validator. So the router now changed the status to invalid. And in fact, what occurred now was that someone... So the, the path is shorter now. And it's a slash 64. It's not a slash 48, it's a slash 64. So it has preference and precisely that is route hijacking. So what Guillermo did here, I didn't do anything. And why Guillermo? 
como el DNS. Sí. This is like the DNS. It's always the DNS. And in routing, it's always Guillermo. So Guillermo, what he did was to generate through a sinister router, he generated a route hijacking. And because Guillermo's router is connected to the traffic exchange, he injected a more specific block to that same prefix, but a slash 64 originated in a different autonomous system. And what he did, and all the traces that you did, were changed previously, it reached LACNIC's server, and now it reaches Guillermo's router. He hijacked the route, and Guillermo could set up a server exactly like the one of LACNIC, if you wish. I will show you what I did, so that you can see. And simply, there you can see it. The only thing I did was to put SIP in an interface. Mine is 65002. I put this in the loopback. And then I announced this with a network command with a slash 64 and the unicast family. I put six slash 64 so it's more specific. And with that very simple thing, I am redirecting the traffic to my own network. And there I could do just anything. So here we should clarify and say that the router at the traffic exchange point is accepting everything from everyone and sending everything it receives. So Guillermo sent something and the router is resending it. It is forwarding it, everything. everything. So you receive it in your routers. Now, a question that you could ask is, well, if we have just configured RPKI and Erica showed us that she had the cache connected and that the RPKI was configured. Why are we accepting an invalid route? Because the RPKI, Erica, could you share your screen again? But the router is identifying this as invalid. But if I do a trace, Bueno, ¿qué es lo que pasa ahí? ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué? Fíjense la ruta so, que se origina en el 65. You can see the route that originated in 65002. If you look at the last line, the, the third last line, RPKI validation state invalid. The router detects that this is an invalid route, but it's not discarding it. It's not eliminating this. It's using it. Now, why is this so? Well, the only thing that we did was to connect the router with a cache validator, but the router doesn't do anything at all on its own unless we tell it to. So we explicitly have to say what we wish to do. So, uh, Erika, do show run. So you have different options here, but it is recommended to discard the invalid routes and give preference to the valid routes and not the not found. What are the valid routes? These are the ones that we receive through BGP and then they are matched with an ROA. The ROA covers the route and coincides. The not found ones, for example, local preference one, 100, sorry, that local preference 100, those routes that don't have ROAs, those that are not covered by ROAs, and most are not covered by ROAs, <coughs> just 30% are covered by ROAs, well, the majority will fall under this case. So there, we don't change anything. If it doesn't have an ROA, we take it as usual. The valid ones, we prefer them, those that uh, um, and to those that are invalid with that route map, we discard them. So now we would apply that route map to the um, BTP session that we have configured with um, the border 
router and see that that route doesn't appear anymore. Erika, could you show, go up and show the configuration of the BGP? Up, up. There, there, if you look at the, that, you have the BGP configuration. The BGP session with the board uh, is um, the one that had uh, um, uh, LD77, uh, colon C62, etc. Uh, the router, Erika's router and all of yours, with the configuration that we have now, is accepting everything that comes from the border router of uh, the IXP. So what Guillermo says that that policy, that roadmap that we have in, we're going to change it for another route map of the RPKI that is prepared precisely to accept only the blocks that have valid status or unknown and assign the best preference to those that have a valid state status and uh, not so much to those that are known but those that are invalid are not part um, of the route map so it won't accept it so anything that it, it comes from the ixp that when going through the rpki validator sees that uh, it's invalid it's going to install it in uh, the bgp route map so we should uh, no longer see the invalid blocks in our BGP table. Erika, if you wish, before executing the command to change the roadmap, before executing it, if you can do a show BGP IPv6 unicast. Good, and there you can look for the invalid block. There you have it. There, I think that you went by it down there. There, there, the one with the I. That is invalid. We are receiving slash 64. Notice that we are receiving the two slash 48 and slash 64. Slash 64 is invalid. However, it, it uh, remains the slash 64 because it's more specific. So. This wins versus uh, LACNIX. So if now we delete all the invalids, well, there I put what you should put in the BGP so you can cut and paste. Yes, I have it there. In the... I already have the configuration ready. <coughs> now with this, when you apply RPKI, there. Now, something is wrong. Copy what I put in the chat. Yes, the family is different. No, because it, you pasted all the parts of that configuration, there. And now, again, show the BGP. Show BGP IPv6. I always get confused with the commands because you can do BGP summary or just show uh, BGP there. Now, only 48 is there. The invalid block disappeared from the BGP because uh, we applied the inbound BGP is saying that they only accept what is valid. Now, can you apply the RPKI with the same command? Yes. So show MTR to see whether it changed. So now with that command, what we applied was the RPKI validation to discard the invalid routes. Remember that we had done so far was to connect the router with the validator to talk with the 
uh, but not not but not taking making any decisions before showing the screen while Erika shows it they they are requesting one thing Erika could you repeat the command that showed the status of the specific block it must be in uh, the uh, record yes the command uh, to see that now again it should be a valid state well anyway what there is in the roadmap yeah okay. so now it disappeared the prefix that guillermo is publishing disappeared the slash 64 and now we only have the slash 48 that has a valid state and now what is requesting is whether you can show the roadmap and show the roadmap that we are applying now the rpki so if you look at that at the end that is the roadmap of the rpki that matches the two components the first the permit 10 matches the valid state of rpki and applies reference 200 and the second matches the not found i was saying unknown but it's not found and it sets local preference 100 so there there's nothing matching the invalid so everything invalid won't match the route map so it won't be allowed in because and is it not going to be allowed it won't be installed in the bgp table so you filter what is connected invalid and this has an advantage that's good to mention that is if you no longer validate when you don't validate the things that you don't validate not the invalid but those that don't have a specified roa the prefixes for which i do not receive any validation um, are those that the router classifies as not found so if the rpki validator no longer works works with uh, the policy that we want to apply all the blocks would be not found so all those would receive a local preference 100 but with this you don't run the risk that if something happens with the validator you no longer route so if the validator turns off now all the blocks will appear as not found including guillermo's and again the route hijack is going to succeed and the traffic will be deviated because we are no longer validating. So, well, it's, it's already late, so let's go a bit faster. Show the MTR to see whether it's got solved. Now, the MTR, in spite of the fact that the route was discarded because it was invalid, the MTR continues to go wrong in the wrong direction it still goes to my network and why does that happen that is something for you to think what is the problem now we activate the, valid, the rpki validation and discarding the invalid routes the hijacked route the routers you shouldn't have them if you apply the steps so erica doesn't turn it on and santiago doesn't turn it on but it continues to go to my network to autonomous system 65002 and why because all the routers use the border router and that is is not validating the router that is connected with all the rest that the nico administers is not conducting validation so notice how important it is for a route server in an ixp to do validation because if not it would be, be passing the invalid route for others and it would not be uh, in this case if you use that router you would be uh, now if nico I show you the status, the same command that Erika executed, but in the border router in the IXP. And I, if I look at that block that we are using now, 
Here, first of all, you don't have validation. You don't have RPKI validation because this router it does not have an RPKI process connected. It's not running the RPKI process. And if you look at the block, indeed, this is the slash 64 that Guillermo continues to uh, publish originated in the 65002, that's Guillermo's. I don't see the block of the slash 48. It doesn't appear, not because it's not there, but because this one is more specific. Now, if we look at all the BGP table of IPv6, what is in the BGP table? Here it is. It was there. It's this one, right? Yes, it's that one. So this is the good block, the slash 48 published by LACNIC, and this is what Guillermo publishes. But the one that Guillermo publishes is more specific, it wins and beats the other one. So all your traffic, although your traffic is being validated, then it goes to Guillermo's way. If we apply RPKI in the border router, I'm going to do it now. RPKI, let me copy the configuration so we won't waste time. Notice, I don't know whether this is clear, that even if you validate, if you have one single provider to which you go through the internet, it's not very useful because if the provider does not validate, that would be this case, because it is not validate and we only connect with that provider, well, um, I can't, that's the only way I can uh, exit. And if the provider accepts the invalid route, I will end up going through an invalid route. So it's not enough if my organization validates, but I, but I also need to have a provider that will follow that. So now, well, now I turned on the connection with the validator. Here I'm checking that I'm connected to validator too. And now I look at the BGP table again. Remember that the, this table didn't have the last column that is added when I'm validating. So now I look at the BGP table again. No. Now there. I look at the BGP table again and now my border router started validating and notice here I have the two blocks again, but now LACNIC's block is sounds valid and Guillermo's invalid. However, if you look at your um, router, you still do not reach uh, LACNIC, but um, well, somebody removed the screen. No, there to show it. There it comes back. Now apply the RPKI. As I'm going to show you the screen here, what I'm going to do is to apply the same that you applied. I'm going to apply it here in this connection because I know that Guillermo is originating it. So I go to the IPv6 configuration. Where, which was your group? 65002, it's router two, exactly. So it's this one. This is what I'm going to change, the prefixes that I accept. I'm going to change this roadmap and get to put the one that corresponds to it, which is RPKI. Router, BGP. Router, BGP, 65,000. Address family. IPv6. Roadmap, RPKI. And roadmap, RPKI. And instead of accepting everything, I'm going to filter and only accept those that are valid or not found. So let us directly go and look at the block. Executing the same command. 
Ay, no me acuerdo cuál era el bloque, pero ya no está el, el, el bloque, el bloque inválido. Vamos a ajustar el comando para ver. Si miramos el bloque ahora, ahora sí. If we look at the block now, Fíjense que ahí el que está es el barra 48. You see that the one is, that is there is a slash 48. So it now it is valid. And the asked path also changed. And like Erica said, it's there already generated. And I'm discarding the one. But uh, let us look at the last one, the MTR, Santiago. Bien, ven. Ahora, right, so after all this process, we are, we managed to reach destination. Bacolacnic.net.ui is the machine we have at LACNIC. So there you can see the autonomous system, which is 28,000. Well, so this is what we wanted to share with you, to show you with today's lab. So the bottom line is if we had enabled RPKI validation in the border router and in each one's router, you wouldn't even have learned about this. The prefix is just discarded and the MTR and the connection would not be affected. And because this was not the case, we did this on purpose to show all this. But you can also note something else which is very important in an IXP, not to propagate information in and I announced the route and everyone turned it on. If the route server does not announce it, then the others won't be affected. And the other thing is that if you're Ingle, you have just one connection and just one provider, it will depend on that provider. If you have multiple connections, then it is more meaningful to validate with RPKI because this will then rule out those rule routes which are invalid and we'll go through the ones that correspond to it. But it's not so simple if I have a provider that does not validate in my organization. So we're way past the time. So greetings and we now give the floor back to LACNIC. Yes, just to remind you of the ROA competition on Thursday we'll have this session for those who wish to have a space so you can create your own ROAs. And if you have any questions regarding today's lab, this will continue running for today for the remains of today with the current configuration. And well, you have our contact details, our email addresses. So if you have any questions, any doubts, please write because we don't have that much time. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for staying on until now.